This. Welcome to this term's first podcast for kids, made by kids, called North Point. Today we are interviewing the much-loved teacher, Mr. Collum. Ah, sorry, no, no, that's um, that's some other day. No, today we're interviewing Mr. King, who is definitely one of the most loved teachers. Hello, Mr. King, how are you? <laughs> so anyway, I'll just ask, before um, handing you over to the to our other host and interviewers, do you prefer horrible histories to your own teaching? <laughs> now I shall hand you over to our other interviewers. Uh, well, yes, I am. Sometimes. It depends on the sport. You see, conventional sports like football, that's not really my thing. When I was, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but when I was at school, I was in, in uh, the athletics team. I was quite fast at running, and my school really counted athletics as a main sport. So I was uh, taken out away from the other sports to run. Uh, and uh, I did a lot of running at university. I tried a few other things. I liked rugby, but because I was a little bit skinny, I thought I'd, I'd put some pads on and play American football. And uh, we were a weird bunch of uh, players, mainly the sort of rugby rejects. And uh, we got completely destroyed. I mean, the first game that we played, the score was about 72-0. And I ended up with a, a, a very bad, badly damaged knee. Um, but it was quite fun, you know, playing with a helmet on made me feel powerful. I, I love that. I also played a bit of polo at university. I like to ride. And fencing. Because I like uh, stabbing people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we uh, uh, we know you like rugby, but what is your favourite rugby team or national team? I like Exeter Chiefs. So I grew up, uh, when we moved to England, we ended up in Devon, and Exeter are by far the best rugby team. And England. Yes. Um, when you were playing your sport, would, would you ever, like, get told off because you were doing something bad for the sport you were so good? I never thought I was that good. I was a bit like, I don't know if you, now, maybe you haven't seen it, but when you are old enough to watch, there's a great film called Forrest Gump. And Forrest Gump is not particularly good at very many things, and yet brilliant at the same time. And one of the things he gets is a scholarship to go and play American football at university and that's a bit like me and I wasn't very good at doing much of the athletic bits but I was quite good at running so they would give me the ball and I would run I was a running back and that was my job really just hold the ball run until someone tackled me and I usually got quite far sometimes I didn't at all there was a player an American guy who came over from Dartmouth University in America and he was on a scholarship uh, to play with the Dartmouth team in America, proper American football. And he wasn't allowed to play for us, but he coached us and he told us a lot of things. And he would sometimes be one of the umpires, the referees in the game, and he would cheat a little bit. And sometimes he could read the, the defence so well that he would say to, to me, he'd come over and go, when you get the ball, run through the B gap and you'll be fine. And I'd just follow what he told me to do. And because of his superior skill, I was usually okay. You know, I have thought about this. I, I do love history. There are lots of periods of history that I'd love to travel to. There's not really that many that I'd like to live in. I think we currently live in the best time. I mean, the modern times are definitely the best when you go by quality of life. And, and I mean medicine, life expectancy, and that sort of thing. So being alive now is the best time in history to be around. It might not be as interesting as some previous times. If I were to go back, I'd want to go back to a time and I'd have to make sure that I was 
the right class, if you end up being a, a peasant, for example, your life is going to mainly be just acting like basically like a slave on the land, just working six days a week and then spending the seventh day being told that you might go to hell. And uh, I think that if I could pick a time, I'd quite like to go back to the Napoleonic era, maybe be one of the Duke of Wellington's exploring officers during the Peninsular War. They were a group of loners like me who would travel around Spain, Portugal, France, and they would map out the landscape and spy a bit on the, the French at the time, the enemy, and report back. And so they helped Wellington eventually beat Napoleon. And that would be quite an exciting life, I think. Or one of the sailors in Horatio Nelson's Navy, something like that. I love the idea of lots of these things, but doing them for real would probably be quite scary. Battle Britain pilot, love that, but I don't want to die. So we'll see. I grew up with quite a diverse family from all over the place. So one of my grandmothers is Polish. She was in Auschwitz, uh, one of the death camps in World War II. And we don't know her story. She's still alive. She's 95 this year, same age as the Queen. But she's never spoken about her story. And I think the curiosity as to what she did, her life, what it was like at the time, we can only find out by studying history. My dad is a war crimes lawyer, so learning about some of the things that he's done in his career and being, you know, he spent a lot of time in Bosnia and Kosovo was fascinating. My grandmother grew up in South America, a place called British Guyana, and I think the only way, the closest thing we have now to time travel is learning about history. And they're stories, they're interesting stories, and we can pick. There are things that everyone loves history, there are things that you love that you know, could be football you. And you will be passionate about it and you'll go back and you want to look at all the things that your team have done, all the, all the famous matches and the glory days and learn the background to them, where they got their nickname and all the origins. And that's how history is for me. You know, it's bits that I'm interested in and those are the bits I know well, but I certainly don't know all history. But I think we're all interested in history to some point. And um, as well, when you, if you were like, could travel, would you, um, like, would you go to like one of your family members, or would you go to like someone famous? So I think I would like to. I'd love to go see my granddad. I'm named after him, Colin. I never met him. He died before I was born, and I think meeting him would be really interesting. He was an intelligence officer during World War Two. And he did a lot of top secret stuff that nobody really knows about. Quite cool now that you'd be allowed to talk about it. The war's over and won. And uh, it'd be quite nice to hear what he did. But equally, just being a fly on the wall, going back to different periods in history and just seeing things and, you know, what, what were they like? You know, I'd love to know what people looked like. I mean, Trojan War, imagine meeting someone like Helen of Troy or... Uh, going back and seeing Achilles for himself, you know, someone like that would be quite fascinating if they were real. Um, maybe just Anne Boleyn or Henry VIII or just anyone. Go back in any period in history and just have a look. I don't really want to be involved, but just see the people and hear things over here. Just be invisible, but just watch. It. That's what I'd like. Can you tell us about your time in the army? Ah, well, you see, I was never properly in the army. I joined after university, I was, so I was sponsored through university by uh, the, the army, and, and, I, and I was to join the intelligence corps, which was my granddad's old regiment, and I was very excited. All I wanted through school was to be in the military. Initially the Air Force, but I was told that uh, my history of asthma would prevent me from doing that. So I... Uh, lied a little bit to my application about having asthma, which I did have, and I was able to get through the tests. Something it was quite a complicated process. And I went through the, at that time it was called, uh, well now it's called AOSB, Army Officer Selection Board, 
And then I ended up with my start at Sandhurst, which is the officer training school. And I was found to have asthma, uh, which you're not allowed. So they told me I had to go three years and then I could rejoin and carry on. And that's sort of how I ended up teaching because I thought, well, what am I going to do in three years? And I thought, well, I'll go off. I'll learn to be a teacher. I, I taught in my gap year in Peru when I was, uh, uh, you know, just between school and university, and I really enjoyed it. And I thought, well, I'll go do that. I can travel a bit with teaching, and in three years, I'll rejoin the army. Uh, and within three years, I found myself qualified as a teacher, working in Kenya, loving life. And then they called me to say, would I like to come back and carry on the training? Things have changed a bit. I had a friend who had gone through Sandhurst and gone off to Afghanistan and died. And that shook me. It really actually made me think a lot about life and death and mortality and things that really you should have thought about anyway, if that's your career choice. But I decided I was loving life. I, I was having an adventurous life. I even got in a few situations where gunshots were going off, a bit like in the military in Kenya. And I got to do some exciting things out there. And I thought, well, this, I'm, I'm having a great time. I don't need the military for that excitement. But I do regret it sometimes. I do think, I wonder how life would have been different if I had joined. It's still my first love, the military. How do you, how do you think life would be different if you did rejoin the army and go to Afghanistan, let's say? Uh, well, I think I would probably be a different type of character, I suppose. I'm not sure if I would cope well. I mean, since, since all of this, when you're young and optimistic about life, you have all these views about action and being a hero and this sort of thing. And I love all the stories and adventures that, that you can have. But I think, I think I might have found that in time, you know, being involved in something like that might have I don't know. I feel like maybe it wasn't the best job for me now, looking back in hindsight. I feel like I'm good at just chatting to people about history and having long holidays, which is my job now. So I don't know is the answer. I, I like to think I'd be some sort of superhero, medals all over me and like marching around a lovely uniform, but uh, probably I'd just be bumbling along. You know? <laughs> yeah. Is that like, say, if you went back in time and you're thinking you're going to fly as a rebel pilot or a rebel two pilot because you had experience in the Yeah, I mean, my, some of my first loves in life were to, to do with the military. So, I mean, I remember my dad loves aeroplanes and I remember watching Top Gun growing up, falling in love with the, the F-14 Tomcat, the plane they fly, and then reading books like Biggles, uh, it's about a World War One pilot flying in you know, a stopless camel. He goes on and flies Spitfires in World War Two, and just being excited by all those adventures. And then my interest in the military also got me interested in you know all these wars, and it just leads to so everything ties into history, and that's why why I love it so much. Well, like I said, I was only there very briefly. Um, but I did learn a little bit about having to rely on yourself, being more uh, confident. In fact, one of the subjects I took at A-level was drama and theatre studies. And I took it purely because I knew I had to get my confidence up. I needed to be someone who was able to talk to a group of soldiers and potentially lead them into a war zone. And... I think in the short space of time that I did do a bit, I mean, I was in the cadets and things at university, and I did lots of adventurous training and things. And I think that that does teach you resilience. It teaches you uh, skills that are quite useful. You know, there are times I've been incredibly cold, and I think, oh, I remember when I was doing a training exercise with the Marines, lying in a forest, so cold that my eyes were sealed shut from you know, ice, icing over on the eyelids and I think uh, well it's not that bad you know life's pretty good and sometimes I'm glad you know like I'm not lying in a bush 
in a platoon harbour guarding an area, um, and I can go to sleep in my comfortable bed. So, yeah, that, I, I think it's an appreciation for what the military do, and I, you know, I'm still very proud of the military, but I wish in a way that I could claim a bit more, but I can't, I can't really take credit for being in the military. It wasn't really something I'd ever did properly. If you could have dinner with a famous person, dead or alive, who would it be? Uh, I assume you don't mean like a dead person, because I don't really want to have dinner with a dead person. Do you mean dead or alive? Um, I mean, if, if they were alive right now. Oh, okay. I think you meant like just put a dead person. <laughs> I don't really want to have dinner with a dead person, thank you. Um, if I could have dinner, I think, I mean, it probably it probably have to be, I'd be, I'll have some fried chicken, and I'll have it with uh, Colonel Saunders, KFC, I wanted to find out the uh, the secret to his eleven herbs and spices that he uses. <laughs> when you if you had then when you had a, um, with, with someone, would you ask them like um, like um, would you um, can can you give me my phone? Can you give me his? Can you can you give me your phone number? Stuff like that, so you can keep in touch. So if I mean, if I meet someone, will I ask for their phone? Yeah, like a famous person. A famous person. Oh yeah, I'd love to. I mean, I I was quite lucky without naming names, but I did work for a year as a private tutor for a celebrity, and I was quite lucky to meet quite a few celebrities through that person because I, I worked for that that one family full on, and they had quite a few. Famous people come and visit, and uh, on my phone now, I actually have a couple of famous people's phone numbers, and I'm not really supposed to, so I've never called them, but I just quite like the idea that I've got I have to have them, because I have to sometimes drop things off or pick things up from them, and uh, I kept them, which I'm not supposed to do, but, you know, I quite like the idea of having them just there. Tell us about the green gummy bear story. The green gummy bear. This is quite a long story, but to cut it short, uh, there was a green gummy bear that appeared in my flat in Kenya. So when I was working and living out in Kenya as a teacher five years out there, or maybe in my second year while I was there, I had a situation where a green gummy bear kept appearing inside my flat. Now, I have no idea. I call it the mystery of the green gummy bear. I have no idea to this day who put it there, why it was there, why a green gummy bear. Can you even get green gummy bears there? I don't know. I mean, you could buy Haribo, I assume, out there, but it's very expensive. And if you have them, why would you waste a green gummy bear? But, you know, I love green gummy They're delicious. But I would turn up in my flat from work and I would find a green gummy bear positioned around the house. And sometimes it would be on my sofa, sometimes on top of the TV, sometimes on the bookshelf or on either, you know, you have tea, coffee, sugar, those little tins on top of there. And I'd come home and I'd see it there and think, that's weird. Why is there a green gummy bear in my flat? And the first time I saw it, I didn't really think much of it. I thought someone must have dropped it. Maybe I thought my, so I had a, a girl who come clean the house. Yeah. During the day, so I thought maybe it was her. I mean, she's the only person who could really be in the house during the day. And I threw it away. I didn't know where it had really been. And maybe two weeks later, another one appeared, green gummy bear, and it'd be on the bookshelf. And I'd pick it up and think, hey, hang on, that's I, why? Like, that's so weird. Like, why would someone put a green gummy bear in my flat? So I took it, chucked it away. I came back, maybe. A few days later, another one stuck to my wall. Like someone had licked it and stuck it from its back on my wall. I thought, what? Like, who's coming into my flat while I'm away at work and putting in a green gummy bear? I had no idea who was doing it. And by this stage, I was a bit freaked out. So I took it and I thought, right, well, I'm going to throw it. Yeah, in case it's the same one, I tore it up. I threw it just into my garden. Well, maybe a few days passed after that, another one. And another one. They kept turning up. I kept throwing them away. And the scariest one was, you see, we lived in, uh, uh, it's Kenya. There's lots of insects. So I would have a lovely four-poster bed 
but with mosquito nets coming down on it. And at night, to be safe, we used to do something called, it's like an onion, you have lots of layers of protection, just in case something bad happened, you know, some dangerous things can happen in Africa. And we would lock all our doors all the way up, so I had my the door, the hall, the kitchen, the living room, and then my bedroom, and all the doors locked. I went into my four post to bed, pulled the mosquito nets down, went to sleep, and in the morning, when I woke up, on the pillow next to me was a green gummy bear. And I was terrified. I was like, what? Somebody has come into this flat while I'm sleeping, broken in. Now, I can only think that I went to sleep and it's already there. That's, that's what I hope. But part of me thinks maybe somebody or some ghost or someone has come in and put this, or the gummy bear itself is crawling in there. I don't know, but it terrified me. I told people at work, I told them, they were all like, oh, you're making it up. You're, like, you know, you're just doing it for attention. You're, you're like, who would do that? Don't be silly. Or maybe they'd say, oh, have you asked Kathy, who was the, the cleaning lady who would come and clean my flat? I did ask her. She almost burst to tears, like, no, it's not me, it's not me. I, I'm not accusing you. You're, you're fine. I'm not going to buy you. But I don't know. And to this day, I, I thought maybe when I left, one of my friends would go, by the way, it's me. But to this day, I have no idea who put the green gum No, I was. I mean, I do love gummy bears, but I didn't know where it would be. And the one that looked like it'd been licked and stuck on the, the wall, no thanks. In fact, actually, I missed the one. The last green gummy bear that turned up in my flat was on my picture frame. I had three pictures on one wall and on the very top. I don't know how long it had been there. That's what I thought. That sometimes it might have been there days before I spotted them. And I saw this green gummy bear just sat on that picture frame. And I thought, you know what? I'm not throwing it away. I'm going to leave it there. And it stayed there for maybe another two, three years or however long I was in Kenya. I never threw it away. And I never got another green gummy bear. And by the time I left, it was no longer green. It was sort of clear white because the sun had bleached it so much. Did you take it with you to England as a souvenir? I did actually. When, when I left, I couldn't even pry it off the, the picture frame. It was stuck to it. And uh, it came back with me to England and it uh, strangely fell off during transit. Uh, and it is no longer on the picture frame. I still have the picture frame. Though. I actually am really bad with jokes and any jokes I know are incredibly rude but I can tell you one uh, let me just go to Google uh, why were the early days of history called the dark ages because there were so many nights uh, I'll give you one more here I've got loads of them um, I'm glad you liked it. Who made King Arthur's Round Table? Circumference. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I have no idea this would be so successful. <laughs> you can end it by that, yeah? Yeah. So it's been great to talk to you know about all these interesting things now. I never knew about the gummy bear next to me. And um, I think this is going to turn into a great interview. Maybe, now that the gummy bear story is out there, yeah. someone listening will know who did it and get back with the answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I have no idea. It's quite weird. Well, it's so like Mr. Stenning, wouldn't it be? Well, Mr. Stenning did grow up in Kenya, so there's oh, a good oh, chance. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs>